Thank you. Thank you very much. I know all about stress. I have so many duties and responsibilities. Uh, Virginia only just the tip of the iceberg of all my responsibilities. When she said one of the biggest monasteries in the southern, it is the biggest monastery by far. Twenty-seven monks I'm supposed to look after. Eleven bhikkhunis I'm supposed to look after. A huge retreat centre I'm supposed to look after. And a huge city centre who I put all these talks online. And if that isn't all, I also come every year to the Buddhist Society of Victoria where I'm the official spiritual advisor a position enshrined in your constitution. I'm also the spiritual director of Santi Monastery in Sydney. I'm also the spiritual advisor of the Buddhist Society in South Australia. I'm also the spiritual patron of the Buddhist Fellowship in Singapore. And also the spiritual patron of the Brahm Centre in Singapore and also one of the main teachers in the Buddhist Gem Fellowship in KL, and also the spiritual patron of the uh, Bodhinyana Foundation in Hong Kong, and also the main advisor for Ahipasako Foundation in Indonesia, and also the patron of the Ajahn Brahm Society in Colombo in Sri Lanka, and also a trustee of, 96 trustees of Anukampa Bhikkhuni uh, Foundation Monastery, that's in London. And also the founding president of the Australian Sangha Association. And many other things as well. With all those responsibilities, with the future of Buddhism on my shoulders, especially here in Australia. I'm very stressed out because in a few weeks we're going to get the results of the census. <laughs> and if the number of Buddhists in Australia doesn't increase, if I don't meet my sales targets, <laughs> I'm going to be sacked. <laughs> I'll lose my productivity bonus. <laughs> That's only a joke, don't worry about such things. But I literally do do a lot of work, as well as sort of writing books, best-selling books. There are best-selling books. And how can you do this without stress? How can you, as I was saying today, I probably spend more time when I come to Melbourne signing books and posing for photographs <laughs> than I do actually giving a talk. And you try that, sitting down for one hour, signing a book and smiling. Signing a book and smiling. <laughs> it takes a lot of training. Which is, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why that I always have to do my exercises in the morning. You know, it's important just for a healthy life always to do exercise. I always do my 10 push-ups every morning. I do 10 push-ups every morning. One, two, three, four, five. I do my exercise, my smiling muscles, which is a well-known way of overcoming stress in your life. You don't have much choice about all the work you have to do. But you do have a choice in how you do that work. You have a choice of moaning and complaining and bitching and finding fault, or you can always find fun in whatever you have to do. So the first story of how to be mindful and no stress and having such a free and empty mind, not full of complaints. It's something I was mentioning this afternoon. It's a meditation technique, but it's also a technique for life. 
which people find simple but highly effective. <coughs> it is the story of the Emperor's Three Questions. And I read this when I was a student. I was uh, really like Russian literature. And as a student I picked up a book from the library of short stories by many authors. Tolstoy was in there, Chekhov was in there. I'm not sure if Dostoevsky was in there, but Chekhov certainly was. And it was a book of short stories which these Russian authors collected together as a fundraiser for the Jewish community in Imperial Russia, which was being um, given a very, very hard time. They wanted to support them, and so they actually wrote this little book of short stories. And one of those short stories was the Emperor's Three Questions. And when I read that, it just changed a lot of my life, which is why I remember it, why I share it with you today. Overcoming stress. And the story was an emperor was really upset with organized religions. In other words, they were always arguing with each other, always saying, I'm better than you are, I am right, you are wrong. You all know what I mean by religions, always fighting and competing, who's the best? And he said, well, I'm an emperor, I'm going to make up my own religion. And he decided, after much thought, you only needed the answer to three important questions, and that's all the religion you needed, which would help you in your spiritual life as well as your secular life. And the three questions were, when is the most important time? Who is the most important person? And what is the most important thing to do? Eventually he found those answers and that was all he needed to be a successful emperor and human being. But when I read those answers, the first answer to the first question was obvious. When is the most important time? Is it Anzac Day? <laughs> I, I had to share this story with you. But there was uh, four men went into a pub here in Melbourne. Englishman, Irishman, Scotsman and Australian. And the Englishman told everybody, he said, today all the drinks are on me. Why? Because today my wife gave birth to my first child, a son. And because it's St George's Day, he said, Englishman, it's a patron saint of England, I decided to name my son George. At which the Scotsman said, that's so weird and strange, because my first son was born on St Andrew's Day, patron saint of Scotland. So I call my son Andrew. Wow, said the Irishman, my first son was born on St. Patrick's Day, so we called him Paddy. And the Australians said, this is such a coincidence, because my son was born on Anzac Day, so we called him Biscuit. <laughs> ho, 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 ho. <laughs> and that is an original Ajahn Brahm. Creation joke. <laughs> so now is the most important time. So always now is the most important time to forgive, to let go, to tell somebody you've hurt that please forgive me and to forgive other people who've hurt you. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait even till later on this evening. If somebody you really want to say how much you appreciate them and love them, say it, say it now. Because tomorrow is always too late. My father died when I was 16. I always felt a bit guilty. I never expressed how much I respected and loved him. Because as a young teenager, you weren't supposed to do that, to say, Dad, I love you. You're supposed to be cool, aloof, independent, like teenagers are. So please, don't wait till tomorrow. Now is the only time. It's the only time you have. So why do you keep worrying about the future? It causes you so much stress. Where is your future made? It's right now. This 
is where you are making your future. This is the only time you have to do anything for your future. So people actually worry about the future, send their mind into the next hour, tomorrow or whatever. You are actually neglecting your future, spoiling it by not putting your attention in the place where your future is being made. And as for the past, my goodness, you can't fix up the past, it's finished, it's done, it's completed, it's dead, the past. So why do you keep carrying the coffins of dead moments on top of your head? It makes no sense to me. So, how can you let go of the past? It's so simple to do. If you're holding on to a bad memory from the past, which fills your mind with negativity, so you can't really be aware and mindfully enjoying this present moment, you're worried about <coughs> grief, loss, you've been cheated, please, you do have a choice. You can let it go. Recently, just over a year ago, a burglar came into my monastery in Perth and stole a lot of expensive building equipment. Stole a generator, a couple of chainsaws, expensive drills, and after he stole it, some people got very angry. That's double bad karma, stealing from holy monks. I said, hang on a moment. Always burglars, they can steal your possessions, but never allow them to steal your happiness and your peace and your forgiveness. You don't need to let them steal that. And anyway, all those generators and chainsaws, they were all insured. So we could buy new ones, which were much better and much cheaper. And so in the end, we got, for the money we got on in insurance, replacement generators and chainsaws, much better than what we lost. We came out of it so well, with a profit, <laughs> that I'm really asking the priest, can you please find that burglar, not to prosecute him, but please ask him to come back again next year so we can do the same again. <laughs> That's actually true. So you always see the positive side in the past, not being negative. But if there is something you can't see anything positive in at all, then it's useless. So I tell people, people who have had trauma in the past, if you want to allow that to disappear from your mind so you can be free, you have to do the following exercise. Standard psychology, but with an extra addition from Ajahn Brahm. You have to acknowledge it, first of all. Get a piece of paper and write it out, what happened to you. It's important, you don't hide it, but you bring it out to the surface, with as much detail as possible. But, what's really important for this exercise to work, is the type of paper you choose to write these terrible memories on and the colour of the ink. Choose to write it down on toilet paper and in a brown felt pen. Dark brown is the best colour. <laughs> because when you write it down, these terrible things which happen to you, in dark brown ink, on toilet paper, you make what we call in psychology an association <laughs> with the other brown stuff which goes on toilet paper. <laughs> when you write it all down, you are <laughs> acknowledging that what you are remembering is shit. And even if you're the head of the World Wildlife Fund, even if you're the boss of Greenpeace, even they do not use both sides of a piece of toilet paper for wasteful environmental vandals. If you just get a small bit of brown on the toilet paper, you don't fold it up, put it in your pocket and keep it for the next time, do you? That's gross. 
Even a small bit of brown on the toilet paper, you put it in the bowl, you flush it away, you don't keep it. So when you write down all your bad memories in brown felt ink pen on a piece of toilet paper, it doesn't matter, toilet paper is really long, very cheap, you can write down a hell of a lot of stuff on a piece of toilet paper. Then you read it, make the association, this is not something you should be keeping. So then, you have to do the ceremony. And there's a special shrine where you do <laughs> that ceremony. It's called the toilet cubicle. You go in there, but don't put it in the bowl yet. One more time, read it out to yourself. All those terrible stuff which has happened to you. Read it out to yourself again. Complete that association. This is not something you should be keeping. And then you do the ceremony. You put it in the bowl. And if you're a Buddhist, you can do some chanting if you wish. <laughs> if you're a Christian, you can cross yourself. And then the final part of the chanting, pressing that little button. <laughs> and that toilet paper goes out of your life forever, hopefully together with the bad memories. You may laugh at that, but it works. But please do not do it in Collingwood Town Hall. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll never let us come here again because we block the toilets every time. <laughs> but it does work as association. Why are you keeping that stuff? It makes no sense at all. Just like when I go to people's homes to visit, I always like looking at the photographs they have on the wall. When you look at the photographs of the wall, what do you see? Now, maybe their marriage on holiday with their children, maybe graduation is one of the ones where they throw up their hats in the air and all those happy memories you have on the wall in your house. And in all those houses I visit, I've never ever ever seen a picture of someone when you're sick in the hospital. I've never seen a picture on the, on the shelf of you stuck in the Melbourne traffic. I never, <laughs> on holiday, yes. I've never seen you doing your, your homework or exams to get your degree. Passing the degree, yes. I've seen photographs of you getting married. I've never yet seen a photograph of you at the lawyer's office going through the divorce. <laughs> Why not? Because no one would put unpleasant photographs in their room to remind them of the painful moments of the past. You only keep the happy memories. Why? So you can look at those and enjoy them, uplift them, give you some happiness. You do that with photographs. But your photographic album between your ears called your memory, you just keep the rotten ones, the shitty ones. Those are the ones should be flushed down the toilet and the good ones kept. Try it. Why not? So when you can let go of the past and the future, you have so little stress, you live in the present moment. That's the most important time, the present moment. Now, number two, which is really excellent to deal with all you have to do in life, all the stress of life. Who is the most important person? Those of you who think yourself, put your hand up. You are wrong. <laughs> you know, people are like sheep. You know, one person put their hand up, other people were looking around. It reminded me of when I got uh, caught. Um, I was invited to give a talk at a primary school. And I didn't realize who I was going to teach. It was grade ones and twos. How can you teach Buddhism or meditation or Dhamma to grade ones or twos? So I had to improvise. And I improvised really well. Had about 60 kids, you know, five and six year olds. So my question was to them all, put your hand up if you don't like rice pudding. If you don't like rice pudding. And about a couple of kids put their hand up and all the other five or six year olds, they looked around, they put their hand up too. And in about two minutes, the whole 60, or 60 people decided they did not like rice pudding. 
Put your hands down, kids. Now, put your hands up if you've ever eaten rice pudding. And about six kids put their hand up. And all the kids laughed, they got it. Why do we just believe what other people do? That was an amazing experience of teaching something to five and six year olds straight away with a very simple exercise. But anyway, back to the most important person, it's not yourself. The most important person is the one right in front of you, whoever that happens to be. And that was really shook me as a young student. Because I remember going up to professors, asking them questions which were really important to me. And those professors and lecturers would be pushing me away. They weren't paying attention. They were just trying to get rid of me as soon as possible to get onto someone more important. You probably experienced that. You go home, you speak to your partner, and the partner is pushing you aside. They'll speak to you later because they're tired or they're busy. That really sucks. It's terrible to feel that when you speak to someone, you're not, they're not giving you any importance, any respect. And that's one of the reasons, one of my secrets, when you come up for a photograph, and I do thousands of photographs wherever I go, literally, there's no exaggeration, and signing books, I may be tired, but you come up in front of me, I remember that story, you are the most important person in the world to me at that time. All those photos and autographs I signed before, they don't count. Those which are going to come afterwards, they're not important. The one right in front of me is important. And I hopefully you feel that. that. I really respect you and I connect with you. You are the most important person in the world at that moment. What that means is I can do signing of autographs for hours with no stress. I'm in this moment, giving importance to whatever's happening right now and not worrying at all about the person who's going to come next or the person who's just gone. Give importance to this moment. And the last thing is, well that's the most important part of the three questions, is the one in front of you is the most important person in the world. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the most important thing to do is always to care. And the story Behind that, and I mentioned that, please excuse me, those who are listening to me this afternoon, was when this young Sri Lankan man who had been coming to my temple ever since he was two or three years of age, <coughs> always coming, you know, when he was doing his uh, exams at school, <coughs> sorry, it became very good, and eventually he went to university, medical school, became a doctor. So my cough is the most important thing in the world in the moment, so I'm going to give that attention. <coughs> Very good. So, he came to see me in great stress because he actually said, I can't do this when he was starting off as a doctor. He can't do this job any longer. He's going to resign and find another profession. And after all that work, actually all that study, first year as a doctor, he wanted to give it up. Why? And he said because he had a tragedy. There was a young woman under his care, maybe about 24, 25, and she died. It wasn't his fault, but even though these things aren't our fault, we always tend to feel guilty. We should have done something more, we should have found out what the cause was. And what really was intolerable for him, being the doctor in charge of this patient, he was the one who had to go and tell this woman's husband. The person you chose to live with in your life, the one you still love so much, has died. And your two children, your two young children, have got no mother anymore. Can you imagine just saying that to somebody? He said, it hurt too much. He said, I can never ever do that ever again. I can't do this job. I want to resign. I think you could appreciate 
the, the, the deep pain of having to face somebody else and tell them that terrible, terrible, terrible news. And that's when I told him, he said, you, you've missed the purpose of being a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, a counsellor. Your job is never to cure people. If you think that's your purpose in being a doctor, to cure people, you experience this same feeling of failure again and again and again. Because we all know we can't cure everybody. People die. So you'll be a failure. But that is not your purpose of being a doctor. Your main purpose, your priority, is to care for your patients. Not to cure them, to care for them. And even when they die, they die having been cared for. And that makes all the difference. And you never need to be a failure. You can't always cure people, but you can always care for them. And that's why caring is the most important thing in the world. Not curing. As I said this afternoon, but I'll change the gender around now. If you try and cure your wife of her bad habits, you're wasting your time. You will never be able to do it, husbands. But you can always care for her, and that is the most important. And caring for somebody, you effect more cures. He understood straight away, he still practices that. I saw him only about a few months ago, a specialist now. He cares for people. That's his priority. Curing is a bonus. But the curing, many more people get cured when you make caring the priority. So those are the Emperor's three questions. Now the most important time, the one you're with is the most important person. And the only thing to do in life is to care, not to cure. And that is used, and one place I know it's used, in Cathay Pacific, because when the HR manager heard that, he employed that, with my permission, into his program for uh, flight attendants, for staff, for booking agents, everybody, because that, number one, lessens stress, Imagine being a flight attendant and having to deal with these unruly passengers who always want this, always want that. You can care for them. And when they're right in front of you, they're the only person in the world. You connect, they feel important, even if they're in economy class. That means that you are successful and you are not stressed out. For me, if I start to think of so too many people I've got to look after, that's when I get stressed. One person at a time is easy. This is where we don't fill our mind with all the things we're going to have to do in the future, or all the things we have to do in the past, to fix them up. One thing at a time, this moment is so easy. And I care in this moment. That way you've only got one thing on your desk at a time. Not this whole stack of things which you have to do. Even coming here to Melbourne, giving so many talks and other stuff, that the organisers gave me a schedule. I never look at the schedule. If I don't do this, I can't do that, it's too much. I never look at schedules. I just say, what am I doing now? That is all I'm concerned about. And that is why you never get stressed out. In that little book, which many people have brought, because I signed a heap of them, Happy Every Day it was called. And there's some quotes in there, and I think it's in that book I define what a busy person is. A busy person is not a person who has lots of things to do. A busy person is someone that does too many things at the same time. That's a busy person. And that's what really stresses you out. 
trying to do too many things. That's not efficient. One thing at a time is all I ever do. Which means you don't get stressed out. And also, you are highly efficient. I'm a very productive monk. But you know, there are times when you get tired. And I know that when you get tired, your productivity goes way down. I have written many books. You know what it's like when you're writing something? You're writing an email to someone, or you're writing an article for a magazine, or you're writing something. If you're tired, it takes you forever to write. So I know, I'm mindful, aware enough of my mind and body if I'm tired, no way I'm going to write anything. I relax and wait till I've got some energy up. This is the simile which I usually give every year when I come uh, to uh, Melbourne. What stress really is. How heavy is this bottle of water I'm holding up? I've got to be very careful because I gave this simile once in Imperial College in London made up of very smart engineers. And one of them looked at this and said, that's about 180 grams. Smart ass. <laughs> that's not what I meant. What I meant is the longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. I'm talking how it feels, the experience of holding something. After one minute, my arm starts to ache. After two minutes, I'm in pain. After three minutes, I'm a very stupid monk. What should you do when this gets too heavy to hold comfortably? You put it down. You don't need to throw it away. Put it down for a minute or two. You pick it up afterwards. Yeah, it feels lighter. It's the same weight, but it feels lighter because my arm has rested. If you don't believe me, you can try it at home. <laughs> that is the answer to stress. What happens in stress is that we get lots of things to get through. Our brain is tired. And instead of relaxing, we push through. And all we do is to tire our brain out more and more and we get even more stressed. This is my simile. I invented this. It's gone off as far as Harvard Business School. In Harvard they call it an investment in the afternoon. Business school. You've got to use the right language. Because they encourage people if you get exhausted or tired at work, take half an hour off. Meditation, letting go is the best way. If you can't do that, go for a walk. Just you know, go and have a cup of tea or coffee in a quiet room. Anything, but don't work. Because your brain is tired, is exhausted, it's not productive. Put it down, relax, rest, and half an hour later you can go back to work and you are now productive. And the half an hour you spend meditating, doing nothing, you make that up afterwards, that's why it's called an investment, by getting three hours work done in two, of high quality. It's such an obvious solution that more and more people are doing this in business. I went to Google headquarters in their meditation room. They have a meditation room. You can meditate any time of the day or night. It's not taken off your, your um, time you work. It's understood. This is making you more efficient. Facebook has the same. Samsung has. So many places have time out rooms because if you're tired, you're not productive. And that's the same for your kids at school. Too many kids stay up late at night doing their assignments and they're sitting in front of the computer screen not producing much at all because their brains are exhausted. That is not the way to live a life.
So when I'm tired, I relax. When I'm tired, I do what I call flat-out meditation. <laughs> Relaxation. Let go. Now that is how we can deal with the stress of our modern life. But sometimes people, they worry, I can't do that, I've got too many things to do. There's one friend I know who meditates one hour every day. Every day he meditates one hour, except when he's busy. When he's busy, he meditates two hours a day. Because he needs to be more efficient to get lots of stuff done. And then you can be highly productive without getting stressed out. It's just a way to use your brain reasonably logically. So, that way we can live a much more peaceful life. But one of the other important ways of letting go of stress is having a good sense of humour and not taking life so seriously. As you see, those of you who know me, I don't take life that seriously. When I do marriages, I never take marriages seriously. I tell them that marriage is like a pack of playing cards. You start off with two hearts and then a diamond and then comes the club and a spade. Why are you laughing? There's some truth in it, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> or oh, death and dying. You know, I was one of the first people, I think, in Australia who told a joke at a funeral service so many years ago. And what that joke was, there was an old guy who died and his wife had died you know, a few days beforehand. I've seen this so often when people have been together for such a long time. When one dies, the other one dies pretty soon afterwards. Not always, but very often. And so because these two people died within days of one another, they appeared in heaven together. And they were met by an angel who said to them, you've both been really good people, so I've come to show you your heavenly reward. And took them to this amazing, huge mansion overlooking the ocean on the cliffs. You know, in Melbourne, in Victoria, you'd have to be a multi-millionaire or a politician to avoid get one of those. <laughs> and the husband said, that's a huge mansion. He said, the angel, this is your heavenly reward, enjoy it. But he said, look, someone on my income will never be able to afford the rates. You have to pay, the big thing is true in Victoria, like West Australia, the bigger the house, the more you have to pay the local government. I can't afford that. And he said, the angel said, in heaven, there are no counsellors. Well, better be careful, this is Collingwood Town Hall. <laughs> that was the big There's no rates, you don't have to pay anything, it's for free. And then the angel took them inside. You wouldn't believe how many rooms are in that house. There were chandeliers made out of waterford crystal. There were these huge sofas. And there was a big, huge uh, TV screen, you know, the LCD screen. It was 20 meters wide. <laughs> and the angel said, here on this TV, you can watch the AFL whenever you like and we know you are a Collingwood supporter. I've got to suck up to the owners of this place. <laughs> and in the heavenly TV, Collingwood always wins. <laughs> so you know suffering. And then he took them into the bathroom. And in the bathroom, even the toilet was made out of solid gold. And the button you press to flush the toilet was a diamond 
24 carats. And when you flush, all the water came out was Chanel number five. <laughs> this was a heavenly time. And the whole house was like that. And the guy said, look, someone on my salary will never be able to afford the insurance premium. What are you talking about insurance? We don't allow burglars and bad guys and girls up in heaven. It's all for free. And then he took them to the garage. A triple garage. And the first car was say, stretch limousine. So big it had a swimming pool inside. <laughs> and the second car was one of these all-terrain vehicles. And the angel said, this car can go anywhere. It can even go up waterfalls. And the third car was a Ferrari. A limited edition red Ferrari with a sunroof. And he said to their husband, I know that you always wanted a fast car when you were living in Melbourne. But you could never afford it. And what's the point of having a fast car in Melbourne? <laughs> I've been there long enough to know what the traffic's like. <laughs> so this is your heavenly reward. And the husband said, look, the Ferrari looks amazing. But you can't, I know there's no traffic up in heaven. There must be some policemen with their speed cameras. What's the point of driving a fast car when you're always breaking the law? And the angel said, Sir, there are no police and speed cameras in heaven. You can go as fast as you want. And it doesn't matter if you have an accident, you're already dead. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> and then he opened the doors of the garage. And on the opposite side of the road was this immaculate 18 hole golf course. And the angel said, I know how much you like playing golf when you were alive. So because of your good karma, we built this beautiful golf course on the opposite side of the road to your mansion. And I'll let you into a secret, said the angel, this golf course was designed by Tiger Woods himself. <laughs> how could that be, said the husband? Because when he had that big argument with his wife and he crashed his car, he had an out-of-the-body experience. And when he was out of his body, we grabbed him and he designed the, the golf course before he came back again. And he said, because this is a heavenly golf course, as soon as you get it onto the green, whichever way you putt it, it always goes into the hole. It's heaven. And the man looked at that golf course and looked at the clubhouse and said, this is an elite club golf course. You have to know somebody like Kerry Packer or someone to get invited onto the, as a member of this golf course. And he said, sir, you're already a member. And the man said, what, a life member? No, a death member. <laughs> at which point the angel departed leaving the husband to his amazing mansion with a big TV set which Collingwood always won, Ferrari car and golf course on the opposite side of the road. It was heaven. But this guy, as soon as the angel left, he started getting so angry at his wife, shouting at her, cursing at her, scolding her. And he was cursing and scolding and arguing with her for about five or ten minutes. And when he finally shut up, she said, why are you so angry? You've got the beautiful mansion, you can watch your football, you can drive your Ferrari car, and you can play golf. Why are you so angry? Because, wife. Because, wife. If you hadn't given me all that health food, I could have been up here years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat too much healthy food. There's a golf course waiting for you. <laughs> I like going against the grain, getting into trouble. But, you know, sometimes that takes a lot of stress out of you. 
when you can laugh at life, instead of getting upset. Laughter is something which expands your blood vessels. That's science. And I notice that when your blood vessels expand, they get so wide, they are like putting extra lanes in the highways of Melbourne. The more wide the freeway is, or the highway is, the less likely there is of getting traffic jams. So the wider your blood vessels are, the less likelihood there is of you getting strokes and coronaries. Which is one of the reasons I can put on weight. And I laugh a lot and it balances the dangers out. My blood vessels are so wide. <laughs> I can eat anything and it never gets jammed. And that answered an important question. I always wondered this. Why are fat people always happy? True, isn't it? You know why they're happy? Because all the, all the fat, miserable ones died a long time ago. <laughs> There's only fat, happy ones left because their blood vessels are wide, they can eat whatever they want. <laughs> so anyone who's overweight, you better start laughing quick, otherwise you're dead. <laughs> and it is. Look, the two people I looked up to when I was a young man, and I was interested in religion, spirituality, my two spiritual mentors, who, who I admired and liked to emulate, I don't know if you remember this fellow, the first was called Friar Tuck in Robin Hood. Do you remember him? Friar Tuck in Robin Hood. He was so kind and so wonderful, but he always liked to eat a lot. And my other mentor was even more long-lived. In fact, this fellow was so spiritual, so kind, and so generous, one of the most generous people in the whole world. And he was old when I was young, and always very fat. Santa Claus! <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Santa Claus always fat? Isn't he always happy and generous? And he's been living for such a long time. <laughs> So, no, honestly, to get rid of stress, a lot of happiness, joy, is really important. It gives you energy. But where does that happiness come from? Now I'm going to do five minutes of deep stuff, because this is supposed to be our mindfulness, and a lot of times people teach mindfulness, and they don't really know what they're talking about, not deeply. I come from a tradition which has been practicing meditation for over 25 centuries. A huge tradition with lots of understanding and knowledge of what mindfulness is. And if you just force mindfulness, say, I'm going to be mindful. Yeah, you're sort of mindful, but not that much. To really understand just how your mind works, your mindfulness needs to be really strong, powerfully strong. And the way that mindfulness becomes strong is when you learn how to be still. Well, I live in Australia, in the monastery which I founded, is on top of a hill. The reason we chose a top of a hill to build a monastery is because of tradition. Holy men always live on top of mountains. We didn't have a mountain, so we chose a hill. That's tradition. The only holy person, spiritual person, who lives in a swamp is Yoda. <laughs> but that's Hollywood, that's not reality. So we chose the top of a mountain for our monastery. And I'd been living in that monastery over seven years when this event happened. Beautiful sunny day, I'd been to some appointment, and so plenty of time, I asked the person who was driving me, please let me out of the bottom of the hill, I want to walk up today. It's about 45 minutes walk, steep hill, but pleasant. And so he went on, and I got out of the car and walked. And as I got out of the car and walked up that hill, it was one of the weirdest experiences. I could not recognize my surroundings at all. It looked totally different. 
than what I remembered looking through the window of a car. Even though I've been living there about over seven years, going up and down that hill maybe two or three times a day, a week, sorry. Now it looked totally different. It was so weird, I stopped dead in my tracks and just stared. And when I stared, I saw things I'd never noticed before. You know, little rocks amongst the grass, you know, the, the, the patterns on the barks of the tree, and even the beautiful little stream in the bottom of the valley. And even more, the grass always looked brighter and greener. The colours began to stand out. And I've never seen that before, looking through the window of a car. And it was such a strange experience, I started to contemplate what is going on? How come it looks totally different than what I can remember looking through the window of a car? And the answer is really important. The answer is just simple science. When you look through the window of a speeding car going only 60, 70 kilometers an hour, when you look through the window, light goes to the back of your eyelid, the retina, it's a chemical reaction. And then that sends electrical impulses up. Can you hear it? Okay. Sends electrical impulses <laughs> up into your, op to your optic nerves, into your brain. Now what happens when you look through the window of a speeding car? You have the light reaches your retina before the chemical reaction is completed. More light comes up, dislodges the first image and you have to look at another one. And then another image, another image, another image. You're going so fast that one image does not have the time to fully form which means you only see roughly what's out there without any detail and the colour is always washed out and pastel. It doesn't have time to complete the proper reaction, chemical reaction. So when you get out of the car and walk, the sense of sight has more time to actually form a proper image on the back of your eye. So you see more details and the colours are richer. But when you stand perfectly still, only then does your eye have the opportunity for the chemical reaction to fully form and your mind to explore the image. Only then, when you are still, are the colours rich and pure with all the detail and it becomes Beautiful. This was a surprise to me because I never realized how much detail was out there and how much beauty when I was rushing around looking through the window of a speeding car. The street in which you live, I challenge you, if you want to experiment with this, you probably always go up and down that street in your car. If that's what you do, try the next Saturday or Sunday when you've got a free afternoon walking along that street slowly. And you will see things you've never seen before. And what you see is actually more colourful, more beautiful. This is a great simile for mindfulness. You can't force mindfulness you have to slow down and then mindfulness starts to develop. The slower you go, the more you see. And what you see becomes more beautiful and more delightful. Sometimes that goes to extremes. Like the story I like to tell of being on a meditation retreat where your mind gets so incredibly still that your mindfulness gets so strong that the most unlikely things appear delightful, surprising you. Because on this retreat I was teaching, had some great meditations, really still, and I had to go to the toilet to do a number two. And my mistake 
my error was after doing a number two was to look in the toilet bowl. And my awareness, was, mindfulness was so incredibly strong that when I looked in there, wow! In my whole life, I've never ever seen such a beautiful turd. Now, you may think it's just brown because you've been too fast. You've never really been still enough to see. It's not just brown. There's so many different shades of brown. Brown, brown. And the way that it all complements one another. You know, it was like a Sidney Pollock painting. And not just the colours. Just the little balls, the way they were put together like some sculpture. <laughs> That was amazing, just how it all put together. And there's always you know, a little bit of mucus on there, and so that made it glitter like a diamond in the water. Now, and then, and then, don't rush, you got the aroma. <laughs> that aroma was rich, earthy, not fake like some perfume. This boat of the earth of life itself. This was real, powerful, really rich. It filled all your senses with this explosion of odour. Amazing! And I was looking at that, I don't know for how long, maybe people were waiting to get in the toilet queue for bad luck. <laughs> wow! Wow! This is amazing! And I honestly, I have to admit this, I richly thought of taking it out of the bowl to show my friends. <laughs> and I would have done that except my training. You know my training? My training is not being attached. <laughs> if I had got that training, I would have taken it out. <laughs> it's one of, the, one of the hardest acts of renunciation I've ever done. So tough. To let it go. <laughs> My most beautiful piece of shit. <laughs> but I've been doing this all my life. So I pressed the button. It was sad. It was, I still grieve for that beautiful piece of shit. But I had to let it go. Now that is a true story, believe it or not. <laughs> when mindfulness gets really strong, this stillness. Everything looks beautiful. Honestly. You see beauty in everything. Because beauty is not out there in the world. It's the, the joy and energy which you bring into the experience of life. Sounds become so beautiful when you're aware, awake. It's one of the reasons why depression is low energy, really low energy, which is why there are no colours, everything is grey and washed out. Food has no taste. If you get mindful, food tastes incredible. <laughs> now one of my favourite foods is baked beans. That's simple stuff. But I remember just coming out after one of my meditation retreats and the first thing I put in my mouth was just you know, a spoonful of baked beans. I remember that. That was amazing. An explosion in my mouth. It was like these baked beans only came out of a can, Heinz. And, but they were like the, made by some celebrity chef. Wow! I never tasted baked beans like that before. Not because in the beans, my mind was so incredibly strong, powerful. And you saw beauty in anything. Taste was rich. Now that is not what we've heard before. Because this is part of the, the um, tradition of meditation, stillness. That's where mindfulness comes from. Please don't rush around too much. Take moments just to stop. Build up the energies of the mind. You're all tired. If you build those energies up, it's amazing what you can see. 
Things which you never thought of as being beautiful become amazing. Even things which are beautiful, like a flower, becomes out of this world. William Blake, one of my favourite poets and artists, 17th century, in one of his poems he said, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. That's what mindfulness is. So much you can't see, you're not aware. When you slow down and stop, it's amazing what you see. A whole world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in the most simple of things. And the last is a whole infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour, which is how long I've been speaking. So I better stop now. <laughs> at the end of eternity. Thank you all for this. <laughs> okay, now we have questions and complaints. I wish I'd have taken a photograph of that content of the toilet bowl to prove what I was talking about. <laughs> Yay! Great. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think it's very interesting and it's very useful. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of meditation and how you go about it. So, um, my question is, how do you procrastinate procrastination? How do you uh, before you wash all the dishes from your dinner, rushing off to come here, check how many cups, saucers and plates are clean. Compare them to how many are dirty. And if there's more clean than dirty, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Never do today what you can put off until tomorrow, because you might die tonight. That's obvious, that's logic. So unless you really have to do it, don't do it. Look, people always want to do stuff and finish stuff. And one of the things which again stops stress was this monk who was building his hall in this new monastery. And it came to the time of a meditation retreat. He sent all the builders home. Come back after the retreat's finished. And a couple of days later, a visitor came and said, oh, when are you going to finish building your hall? And this monk said, it is finished. What do you mean, it's finished? There's no roof on the building. There's no glass in the windows. There's no doors in the door openings. There's cement bags and bricks all over the place. Are you going to leave it like this? What do you mean, it's finished? And this very wise man replied, Sir, what's done is finished. And then he went off to meditate. <laughs> now if you want to let go of stress, what's done is finished. That's the only way you have anything finished in life. <laughs> what's done is finished. So procrastinate until tomorrow morning. And then you can start again. The problem is that some people don't understand that. I got into big trouble when I first told that story because on a Sunday, uh, the Sri Lankan parents came to see me to complain. Yeah, please sit down. And they said, our son was going out to a party on Saturday night and the deal was he'd finish his homework before he went out. So we asked him before he went out to the party, you finish your homework, son? Dad, Mum, as Ajahn Brahm said last night, what's done is finished, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I, I, I side with the son. 
Because otherwise getting everything done, everything done, everything done stresses you out. It's never finished. Unless you understand what's done is finished. So now take time off. Enjoy yourself. Procrastinate. Be irresponsible. Everyone tells you to be responsible and that kills you. So a little bit of irresponsibility in life is cool. Saves your life and you start enjoying life. I think I want to start an irresponsible society <laughs> and get lots of members. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Hi. Um, I really like your example with the brown pen and the toilet paper. Okay. But uh, I'm just having a bit of trouble wrapping my head around the idea of focusing now because yep. now it's predicated on the past and the future likewise. And how do you how is it possible to just focus on the present because then it becomes meaningless? Okay, go on. I don't... Because so. like the idea of doing this one thing at a time yeah. um, is still future oriented because then how do you know what you're going to do? Well, you just don't do anything. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then you get bored. I, are you kidding? <laughs> when there's nothing to do, then do nothing. But here's a story for you. Uh, this was told to me, I was a teacher for one year, and this uh, fellow teacher, he'd been in the British Army in the Second World War. And he told me this amazing event, that he was sent to Burma, fighting Japanese at war. Japanese had to join up, British had to join up, it's just what you had to do, even though the, you know, many of those soldiers weren't violent at all, they just had to do it. And so he was in the jungle of Burma with about five or six other soldiers on patrol. They had a scout and a captain, and the scout came back and told the captain, who told everyone else, that they had stumbled un uh, unknowingly, unpreparedly, into a huge number of Japanese troops. They were totally outnumbered, and surrounded. There was no way out. Now this is war. And he thought that that was the end of him, he was going to die. And if anyone is in those situations you know, of war, where the people fight real bullets at you, you never know who's going to be the hero. He actually stood up and said, let's fight our way out. He said, the, the proper thing to do as a man, yeah, we're likely all to die, but maybe we can take some of the enemy soldiers with us into death. That's a heroic thing to do. But his captain said, no. We will not try and fight our way out. Instead, said the captain, we will all sit down and have a cup of tea. It was the British army after all. But even though it was the British Army, this young man thought, this is a crazy order. How can you think of drinking a cup of tea when you're about to die? But orders were orders, so they had to do, he thought, the maddest thing he's ever done in his life. Before they finished drinking the tea, about ten minutes, the scout came back and said, put your stuff away quickly. The enemy has moved, there's a way out. And they all took that way out. They all escaped without any injury, which is why he could tell me that story. The wisdom of that captain saved his life and all the other lives of his friends. Where there's nothing to do, learn how to do nothing. Human beings today don't know how to do nothing. We know how to do stuff. When it's time, there's nothing we can do. We just panic and kill ourselves and destroy our relationships and mess up the world. We're all great at doing stuff. 
but mindfulness and rest is how we don't do stuff, how we can relax and rest. When you have a weekend off, what do you do? Where are you going for the weekend? Oh, we've got to you know, clean the house up, go shopping, go into the country, go to the beach. Why on earth do you spend so much money on your house when the first opportunity you have to enjoy it, instead you go off to Bali? Isn't it the case there's no bed in the whole world as comfortable as your bed, in your bedroom? Your house, you've decorated it, it's the most comfortable place in the whole world. Why can't you just stay and enjoy it? But if you tell your friends, where are you going for the holidays? I'm staying in my house. What are you doing? Nothing. <laughs> they think you're mad. I will think you are wise. Okay, there was a monk, a Buddhist monk received a telephone call. The telephone call came from somebody who said, we need you to come to our house to do a ceremony. The monk said, sorry, I can't come, I'm busy. And the caller said, what are you doing, monk? I'm doing nothing. That's what monks are supposed to do, we're supposed to do nothing, be examples. And the caller said, great, marvelous, as long as there's somebody who's meditating and not struggling and striving and going around doing stuff. Well done, monk. And he called the next day, got through to the same monk. Oh, good, it's you. Now I really need you to come to my house to do this ceremony. And the monk said, I'm sorry, sir, I'm busy. What are you doing today? Same as yesterday, I'm doing nothing. That's what you said yesterday. Exactly, said the monk. I'm not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> So on your list of things to do, put nothing as number one and get that out of the way first. It takes a long time to finish that task <laughs> and then you will understand how to overcome stress. He he he. You know in Melbourne, the only place you find people resting in peace <laughs> is in the cemetery! Do you have to wait that long before you can take a rest in peace? For me, I want to rest in peace now when I can enjoy it. So please don't wait till you're dead to take a break. Death is nature's way of telling us to slow down. <laughs> okay. We've got a question up on the balcony. Oh, yeah, great. Ajahn John, first I must say it's been a pleasure to attend several of your talks over the week. Yep. That's a pleasure too. Uh, but my question is is there, is there any place in mindfulness and political action? I'm thinking of the refugees living in Syria. I'm thinking of Donald Trump, uh, yeah, Trump, you know, he's really uh, uh, annoying and hurting me. <laughs> so is there any place in mindfulness for political action? Absolutely, because uh, I know that uh, Senator Ryan tried to uh, get the Congress, or the Senate, to do five minutes of mindfulness. But most people left when he did it. Because one thing which you notice, if you do some meditation, some quietness, it does take away a lot of anger, a lot of aggression, and it creates a greater sense of harmony and peace. 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, that one of my students, she was a year six teacher in a primary school. And she didn't call it mindfulness or meditation because there's many Christians in that school. She just called it quiet time. Started five minutes at the beginning of the school year, built it up to about 15 minutes every day, and about 30 years ago. And it was so successful, the principal invited me to the school and he said he was a devout Christian, but he supported this Buddhist Australian girl to the max because he saw the results. There was greater harmony 
in the school, not so many in the class, not so many fights. And simple things, like when there was an argument going to arise, some kid got upset at another kid. Another kid would say, can we have quiet time now please miss? And everyone would stop and just do some breath meditation, mindfulness. And that would just calm everything down. And people became really sensitive to each other's feelings. Which is one thing Donald Trump is not. He's not a sensitive man. So when we become sensitive and calm, when we can listen, instead of always having a counter-conversation in our head, it's amazing how we can connect to people. Apparently, on the Q&A TV program, there was one discussion about terrorism and especially problems in the Middle East and solutions. I never saw this, but people told me about this. That one of the panelists was the editor of the Spectator magazine in UK. And when he was asked for a solution, he said that he quoted some research which was done in Sussex University in UK, that when people do meditation, it affects everybody in the locality. They actually do actually get more peaceful and kind to one another. So the editor of the spectator's solution to the problem in the Middle East was to parachute in Buddhist monks <laughs> and get them to meditate in Syria and that would calm everybody down. When I heard that, I started thinking of a couple of Buddhist monks in my monastery I would like to parachute in. <laughs> But that was not a very good thought. <laughs> but it's true. It does get to the heart of the problem. Why people can't get on with one another. Because honestly, that when you do get really mindful, you can see much more, much deeper than the things which make you angry at somebody. And also you can see the beauty in other people who are totally different than you. If I can see the beauty in a piece of shit, <laughs> how easy it is to see the beauty in a terrorist. Weird, but true. So yeah, it has huge, huge potential. Okay, so over there. Okay. I get the now and the present, yeah. but what's wrong with learning from your mistakes and having hope for the future? Hope for the future is great, but learning from mistakes, they make you very depressed. Why don't we learn from successes? For example, I don't know if you've got a partner. If you've got a partner, you go out and have a wonderful time together. Oh, they're right next to you there. You have a wonderful time together. Now everything goes right, but you make one mistake and she keeps reminding you of it again and again and again and again. <laughs> Thousand wonderful things, but mistakes we keep reminding and that wrecks your relationship and it makes you depressed. Instead, why don't you talk about all the successes you've had in the relationship? Have a beautiful night. Why that? Keep reminding him. What a beautiful night that was. That was a wonderful night. Great night tonight. Thank you so much. Keep reminding him, him about that every week. So you actually learn what works. The secrets of success. And then you repeat success. Let go of the mistakes, but learn from what goes right. Imagine that in a company or in a football team. You know, you lose the match and everyone feels down and depressed. They feel bad about themselves. They lose their motivation. Imagine that you forget about the mistakes, but when you succeed, you have a debriefing. Why did it, you win? What was the cause of you winning? Why? Not only that, because you're focusing on successes, it motivates you, encourages you, builds up your sense of abilities and possibilities. And you also learn the secrets of success rather than focusing on what went wrong. You do things like that 
and you become far more successful in life. Your relationship doesn't founder on mistakes, it grows on successes. Why do you have a good night with your wife? Why? Why? Remember that. Then you'll learn the secrets of success. So if you're going to focus on the past, focus on what worked and why it worked. And then you can repeat it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for posting your talks and guided meditations on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I have found it's been absolutely great in terms of helping me to learn that meditation. Yeah. Um, but I'm also a teacher and I would like your permission or just to pass on what I've of course, there is no, uh, what's it called, proprietary rights or patent. You can't sort of you know, bottle the, 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 uh, the air and sell it on. The air is for everybody. So kindness is for everybody. That's why the, I think you did have to, you paid to actually get in this hall, that's just to pay for the hall. I don't get anything out of this at all. I was told this afternoon, when I give a talk, somebody actually called me up once and said, Ajahn Brahm, I hear you teach meditation. I said, yes. And they said, how much do you charge? And I said, nothing. And they said, well, you can't be any good then, and hung up the phone. <laughs> That's what people like these days. If you don't charge, you can't be any good. So I never say that anymore. When they say, I hear you teach meditation, yes, how much do you charge? I say it is priceless. Which means it's free, but it's not worthless. It's priceless. So of course, off you go and teach. Teach what you know and learn as you go along. Share as much as possible. I know that mindfulness is a big business, but I want to undercut the market. <laughs> it should be free. So yeah, sure. Go for it. Yep. Uh, I don't know, I've got a question. Referring back to how you referred to the most important person being the one standing in front of you. But what happens when placing that person at that level of importance has a cost to yourself? And how do you sort of begin with that cost? It's like, if you are tired, and you said you should never be tired, then how do you sort of put that person at that level of importance if it affects you negatively? You know, a lot of the times if you give importance to the moment, you don't get tired. A lot of times you waste so much energy trying to get rid of people. Figuring ways to escape. Think a way to get out of doing this. When you give full energy to whatever you're doing right now, energy is almost inexhaustible. You make energy. You waste energy when you're negative. Negativity, I don't want this, I want to get out of here. Uh, somebody showed me a TED talk some time ago. Some uh, psychologist was wondering why it is that people like CEOs in stressful positions of management, why some of them get cardiac problems while others don't? Is it their DNA or what is the cause? Why some people cope with stress and they're healthy, other people get sick. And she compared many, many CEOs, they gave them heart scans and stuff, and they found our attitude was the key cause of health or sickness. Those who didn't, gr uh, didn't uh, gripe and complain about their workload, who saw it as a challenge, as a test, who enjoyed it, rather than complained about it, they had good cardiac health and lots of energy as well. Be careful with what we call in Buddhism the fault-finding mind. Negativity. 
If you look for faults, you can find many of them. But if you look for beauty, you can find so much. If that's your partner sitting next to you, it's so easy to find fault in him. That just causes negativity and break up and a lot of suffering. So look for the good parts in him. And then have a wonderful time together. What you look for is what he shows you. If you look for faults, you see so many. If you look for goodness and kindness, it's there. So that's why the fault-finding mind is what destroys our happiness and takes away so much energy. The one you're with is important and it doesn't take any energy. Trying to escape takes energy. Okay, thank you. Next one. Is there like a um, uh, perfect condition for uh, meditation? Like, uh, is it a dark space? Is it a place or uh, like sunlight? Or <coughs> outdoor, indoor? Like, is there a space? <coughs> there is an optimum time for meditation. People often, when's the best time to meditate? The best time to meditate is now. The worst time to meditate is later. <laughs> it's not light or dark noise. Obviously, if it is you know, a quiet place, a comfortable place, that helps. But it's not necessary if you know how to let things be. If you're always a control freak, don't make a noise, don't slam the door. Have you ever noticed if someone does make a noise when you're meditating, the noise is only half a second long, bang. But thinking about it takes minutes and minutes and minutes. Who was that? They should do that. I complain about this. We should not allow people like that to come into our meditation. The sound of the door finished a long time ago. The real problem is the way we react to it. If you understand that, so much of life, dogs go woof woof, Husbands go, I will do it later, darling, and never do. That's the nature of people, so stop complaining. <laughs> Thanks, Ajahn Mahal. We'll just have one last question from a gentleman up in the North Hi, great to Hi. Um, bullying is uh, a major issue in the society these days. Um, I'd like to know if resilient is a solution to bully, and if it is, uh, is mindfulness have any relation to that, or link to that? To resilience, of course it has a lot, but resilience is not enough, because I mean, the main cause of bullying is hierarchies, especially physical hierarchies, when, especially in schools, you get big kids and smaller kids in the same class, in the same playground, or you have it in uh, corporations bosses and people with less power. Whenever there's hierarchies of power, weak and strong, there will always be the temptation for some people to abuse that power. So one way of stopping that bullying is having flat management structures. So you don't give so much power to the people at the top of the hierarchy or in school playgrounds. You don't have, you know, this huge physical difference between you know, young kids and older kids. Separation. So that that gives less opportunity for bullying. Wherever you have hierarchies, there you will find bullying. So we try and abandon as much as possible, we, as possible for hierarchies in this world. Huge power, little power, whether that's economic power, social power, or any other the hierarchical structures which we have in this world. That's where bullying starts. If you have power, some people abuse it. But that's idealistic, that's what you want to work towards. But if there is bullying happening, sometimes resilience is one thing, the other one is teaching people to run fast. <laughs> so they can escape. Because just sitting there and taking it, I don't think that's, that's going to hurt. 
So resilience helps, but wisdom is much better. See if you can overcome the bully somewhere or other, telling the teacher, making a complaint, but unfortunately sometimes you can't make that complaint. Being smart, like videoing the bully. Smartphones are great, because you can turn it on, and then, I never bullied you. And then, yes you did, here's the evidence. So sometimes those things are good. Uh, we had uh, three more questions that came in online, but I think we've run out of time, so apologies. We can get around to all of you. Could you maybe do one of them? Or do we... Oh, yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah, do one anyway. <coughs> so, Buddhism encourages non attachment, and yet humans are, by evolution and biology, social creatures. How do we balance the two, and can we? Yeah, we do balance. Life is always a balance a balance between service and solitude. On that part where the most important person is the one right in front of you, very often there's no one else in front of me except myself. When I go to bed at night, you know, even you, now I've obviously got not a part, got not, uh, not got a partner, I'm a monk, but you, you may have a partner, but when you close your eyes, you're the last person you see before you go to sleep. And I got in a habit of being kind to myself. I actually do this. When I close my eyes, I say, Good night, Ajahn Brahm. Have a wonderful night's sleep. I'll see you in the morning. I say good night to myself because no one else will. <laughs> and when I wake up, I say, Good morning, me. Have a wonderful day. I actually do that. Because when there's no one else in front of me, I'm the most important person in the world then. And I care for me. I really do care for me. Forgive anything bad which I've done. I make mistakes. And then be kind to myself. Wish myself a happy day. So you are important as well. Because a lot of the time in your life, the only person with you is yourself. That's why sometimes as a monk, you have all these rules. You know that no, I'm not supposed to hug a girl. So I miss out on a hug. So what I do sometimes is... I hug myself. So if no one else would hug you... Okay, those of you who want to try it, put your hand out, follow me. <laughs> Hands out. Bring them in. Oh, give yourself a real hug. Oh. It actually feels good. And number two, you know, people don't misunderstand your motives. You can't be done for sexual abuse or child abuse. And also you can't catch any diseases. You already got them, whatever it is. So self self-hugging. Why not? <laughs> okay.